Hello everyone and welcome to The Magic Body. On this channel I am going to be teaching you how to move so efficiently in your body that it will transform your experience of everyday life. I promise you. So what you're going to discover through moving more efficiently is that efficiency is the key to longevity, to staying agile for longer in your life, maybe for the rest of your life. Um, it's the key to having more energy, so ending your day without feeling tired. And it's the key to preventing injury. So when you're moving efficiently, your bones and your muscles are all doing what they're meant to be doing. And then it's also a form, it's a path of mindfulness. So what you'll discover is that the efficient body is the mindful body. So in other words, when your body is efficient, your mind is efficient. So I am super excited to be sharing all this information with you all. And I want to tell you about my backstory and the fact that I came to this information that I'll be sharing with you all um, when I was looking for something totally different. So I was in a professional dance company for 10 years. And when I first started, I was young. And I, I was so young, um, I was only about 20 years old. And I wasn't that good. And it was okay because I was young, you know. But over the course of the first couple of years, I, I was tired of, of not being chosen and, and not being one of the good ones in the group. Um, and, you know, and I would work so hard. I would, <laughs> I would go to class in the morning and I would go to rehearsal. And then after rehearsal was over at 6 p.m., I would go take another dance class or I would go to a studio and practice what, what we had done that day in rehearsal. And I just, I felt like if I could get better at the movement, then I would be chosen. Um, and I was working so hard, even, and what happened was I still wasn't being chosen. And there were a couple people in the company who were like the choreographer's muses. And whatever they did, he just thought was amazing. So when we were workshopping a new piece, he would want to see them try the ideas. Or when he was putting the piece together, they would be in the piece like 95% of the time. Um, and then me and maybe a few others were like in it maybe 10% of the time. And I got so tired of sitting on the side and watching other people dance all day. I was so tired of that. And even when we would go on tour, people would be like, oh, I have so, this piece is so hard. I have so many parts that I'm in, so much movement. And I was just like, screw you. Like while they're on stage performing, I'm backstage doing the movement with them, understudying the part in case I got some big break. But I was working so hard. And, and yet I just still wasn't good enough somehow. And when I would improvise for the choreographer, he'd be like, mm, your movement doesn't have life. Your movement, it's, it's not interesting. Like, I, I don't see you. I, I, it's not interesting to look at. And I was just like, oh, what is it that I'm missing? And then these, these people who are like his muses, they, they were so mesmerizing to watch. And I, I couldn't figure out what makes them have that quality. Because sometimes they weren't even that good technically. But there was something in how they were moving that was captivating for people. We would perform and then after the show, someone would come up to one of those dancers and be like, wow, you know, I, I only could watch you on stage. You were so mesmerizing and so, so... Uh, captivating and just amazing and I was like I wonder if they noticed me I was on stage I was working hard I was doing the movement perfectly because I had studied it to a science but somehow the way that I was doing the movement wasn't interesting to the audience so it, this was a really difficult journey not only did I want the parts but I wanted to understand what made those people such special performers so after about uh, four, five or so years in this company, the choreographer did something different where he made a piece where he wasn't gonna use everyone. And this was the first time that he wasn't gonna use everyone. And all the other pieces, all of us were in it, even if we were only in it a tiny little bit, we were all in it. So that meant we all were fitted for costumes. We all had to put the makeup on, like we were all in it together. And I was really nervous, the thought of like 
if if we if I'm not in this piece, am I going to have a job? Like, will I go on tour if they're doing this piece? Like, how is that going to work? And again, I hated sitting on the side. So the thought of going on tour and not performing, like, what, was that going to happen? Would I just be considered an understudy? Like, there were so many unknowns. And we were doing this piece, and it was to Chinese opera music, which was pretty torturous. And even as torturous as, like, listening to Chinese opera, I studied that music for an hour every morning for a month leading up to the big decision of who he was going to choose. And I would write out the inflections in my notebook so that in the studio when we, when we had to be improvising to that music that I would, I would know the inflection that was coming up and be ready for it. And so at that time, there was one, there was the company, about 12 of us, and then there was an apprentice who was with us, you know, he wasn't even being paid, he was just there to see if he could maybe be in the company, and, and the lowest point was this one day when everybody in the room was given some sort of role or task as the choreographer was putting this piece together, except for me. I was the only person and I remember he kept asking more and more people to join okay you try this come try this and then and then okay for this section you know you're gonna be in this section I kept waiting for when I was gonna be called up and and be part of it and it was this sinking feeling the minute I realized I'm not I haven't been chosen and I'm the only one, even the apprentice, who isn't even being paid. Like, he's in this piece, and I'm not in this piece. And that just broke me. Like, all that I, I had worked so hard for this company, and I had, I had tried to study this stuff and get it down to a science and do it perfectly. And, and it, despite all my effort, I wasn't chosen. And it was interesting because he ended up only using half the people in the company. So then I was like, okay, thank God. Now I'm not the only one. But then two years later, I had sort of earned more credit in the company. I was getting better parts and things were going well. And then he did it again where he did a piece where not everyone was going to be in it. And it came down to me and another woman. And again, I had worked so hard on this movement like I had gone to studios outside of rehearsal and practiced and practiced and practiced listening to the music over and over and over again and that day when um, he announced who he was gonna choose I mean not only was it heartbreaking to not be chosen but then I was also out of a job I was out of a job for the next two months and then I had to go on tour and like we would do the first piece and then the, those of us who weren't in the other piece had to come out and watch it. So I ended up watching that damn piece so many times. And I mean those experiences of working so hard and not still not being chosen and, and I just couldn't figure out what, what am I missing? Like technically I would have gotten really good. But there was something about the way that I was moving that, that wasn't enough. For the choreographer and even I think for the audiences you know and people be like oh great job you're amazing but like what what was that special something that I was missing so I was just really pretty heartbroken and then I stayed in the company a few more years and those were kind of dark years but at that point I just sort of pushed dance away I stopped caring so much and I started feeding my mind. So I was taking courses online while we were on tour and I was so happy to be learning about other things and to um, feel like I was growing again instead of just like trying to figure this thing out and not ever succeeding. So um, finally I left the company, thank God. Uh, I stayed in it long enough that it wasn't a question when I left of, is this the right thing to do? It was like, no, I need to leave. Everyone, we, I need to leave. So I left and I went back to school and I just kind of pushed dance away. And um, I got more into my studies. But what was interesting was that it wasn't until I left the company that I started to answer that 
question of what makes a performer powerful. And I started taking Aikido, which is a totally defensive martial art. And Aikido, as much as it's about technique, it's really about managing your state and managing your energy. And when you can control your energy and control how you respond, then you can have control in a confrontational situation, in a conflict. Um, and that was so interesting to me. And martial arts generally, the idea that like, there was something we were working towards and it wasn't just technique. It was a state of, of strength that we were working towards. And that just like blew my mind open. Cause in the dance company, it was like, okay, I'm working towards doing this movement perfectly, but like, how is that going to help me in life? And this was like, oh, this is about how I can be in my body in life in a way that's powerful and that will help me grow and advance. And the other thing that I was doing after I left the company was I was meditating a ton. I would go to these 10 day silent meditation retreats and there I really learned the connection between my mind and my body. And I could feel when I would start to think a certain way, how my body would respond and how when my body felt a certain way, the way that I would start thinking. So I, I started to um, really understand the connection between mind and body. And I was given very specific tools, which was what I loved about this one meditation technique, Vipassana. This is very simple, it's, very, it's, not, it's not easy, but it's simple, um, where you're observing your breath, your natural breath, or you're observing the sensations of your body. You're not saying mantras, you're not, you're not, you're not doing anything. All you're practicing is to not do, to not think. And by not thinking, these old patterns are coming out of your body. So um, what happened was, you know, I was practicing the meditation and practicing Aikido, and I had gone to a meditation retreat and you know, and I would go to these meditation retreats and I would come home and then I would fall off and not maintain my meditation practice. Or, you know, I'd go to Aikido and I would like practice Tai Chi for a while and then I would fall off. <laughs> and I tried other exercise too. I tried running, but I fell off after about a month. I did yoga. I got really into Ashtanga yoga for about a month and then I would fall off. So even though I was excited by these concepts, I wasn't being consistent with them in my everyday life. And, um, and what happened was I had gone to a meditation retreat and I came back and I remember sitting in my bed and I was in Southern California and I was in this loft bed and I was sitting there thinking about something da, da, da. and then I started feeling my breath coming in and out of my nose and I realized meditation is not like you stop life and then go meditate. Like you can always be meditating. So I went, I got down off my bed and tried to see if I could maintain my awareness of my breath the entire time and maintain my awareness of my breath as I walked into the kitchen and maintain my awareness of the breath as I was cooking. And as I was maintaining my awareness, I was feeling my body, I was feeling the weight of my arms. I was feeling how I was orienting myself in space. So once all this mental chatter turned off, I was feeling exactly what my body was doing in space. And it was this revelation of like, I don't need to make time to meditate. Life is meditation. And I don't need to make time to exercise. Because exercise, life is exercise. The way that I'm cooking, you know, the way I'm holding the pan, I can be practicing the Tai Chi principles or the Aikido principles. The way that I am washing, when I'm washing dishes, I can be feeling my breath and not having mental chatter. And that just changed everything. And what was so funny was that I, I went back to the company here and there for performances here and there, and I was so much better and and people were like wow like you look really good are you you still dancing and I was like no <laughs> I don't do any exercise all I do is walk like and I move about in my everyday life and I take Aikido class but that's you know I did that maybe once a week and I'm not very consistent with that either and they were like but 
man, I mean, you're so much better now. And before, you know, I would be doing movement and da 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 da, -da but I maybe wouldn't realize that my hand was off or different. And now I was able to be doing movement and I could feel my fingertips. And I was aware of the energy coming out my fingertips and out my head. And I was just so present in my movement. And it, I became a very powerful performer. And I, not just like, okay, now I'm more present, but like I can, now I can sort of shape shift the experience of the audience and I can, and I can sense things around me on stage and the energies that I, before none of that was available to me because I was trying to figure it out so hard in my head. And what was amazing was that I figured out what made those people so special that I learned from before. And one of them, I mean, one was that they were, one of them was so efficient in her body, but it was through presence. And I remember I had to learn a part that she did. And I was studying her, this was back when I was in the company, and I was studying her and the way that her joints would collapse, she was a tall woman, but she could become way smaller than even me because she was able to collapse into her joints and the range that she had because she was so efficient and her movement was so efficient that she was able to grow and to collapse in a really interesting way. And the other woman who was like just mesmerizing, that woman is just super, super present in her movement, which means that she's not thinking when she's moving. She's feeling, she's just feeling. And I know that sounds simple, but it took me 15 years to figure that out and to experience it. I mean, I kind of understood it mentally, you know, but it wasn't until I went into meditation and martial arts that I finally could understand and experience what presence meant. So what I'm sharing with you in this channel is that your, the efficiency of your movement can, can bring you into presence and it can bring you into a state where you are conscious of how you're moving and how you're relating to the world around you. And it's really an exciting thing because there's also a destination, there's a point, because the more efficient that you become, the more conscious you're gonna become. You know, if you're into spiritual development, the more spiritually advanced you will become or however you wanna think about it. Um, this is, uh, this is something that you can constantly always be working towards and that brings so many benefits. I mean, more, like I said at the beginning, you, you, you won't have pain in your body and movement will feel free. I mean, I feel like I'm floating half the time and I can walk 10 miles and I feel nothing. And at the end of the day, I can even sit all day long and then stand up and I'm fine. And it's because of the way that I have figured out how to be in my body in everyday life. And that is what I'm going to share with you on this channel. So I hope that you subscribe and that you enjoy the lessons that are to come and that you can experience the beautiful, the, how beautiful it is to be efficient in your movement. So thank you so much and I'll see you soon.